As World War II concluded and life in the United States returned to relative normalcy, a new wave of American individualism and introspectiveness made their rounds across the country. What followed was a multitude of mass movements, fascinations, and scrutiny focused on different groups of Americans, most notably the Civil Rights Movement and the Red Scare of McCarthyism. Another one of these such movements was the Teenage Experience, a look into the lives of American teenagers and their struggles with adolescence into early adulthood. Teenagers and their endeavors dominated the news cycle and found their way into many of the new technologies and mass media of the time. One could not go far without seeing the rebellious teens of the 50s listening to Elvis and revving down the street in their hot rods, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll teens of the 60s, and the activist teens during the Vietnam War's anti-war movement. Films, television shows, and theatrical productions began to shift their focus into catering to these teenagers, and many production companies began producing entertainment focused on portraying the teenage experience for all audiences. One such production was a musical centered around the working class teens of the early 50s and their attempts to navigate the peer pressures and social issues of the time. While most shows that attempt to become Broadway hits already deal with enough challenges, this show added even more difficulty by casting relatively unknown, young actors compared to Broadway mainstays. Ultimately, the risk would pay off, and the musical would go on to be a sensation, launching the careers of many young actors and actresses such as John Travolta and Patrick Swayze. That musical was called Grease. This video is about the other Grease. Sporting competition has been around since the dawn of civilization, but no country has sport more ingrained in its roots than Greece. The Olympics trace its history to the first ever recorded Olympic foot race in 776 BC at the Sanctuary of Zeus in Olympia, which consisted of one 200 meter race won by a cook. Greek warriors are also well known for their athletic ability and raw strength which has been immortalized in movies like 300, 300 Rise of an Empire, The 300 Spartans, and Meet the Spartans. Stop kicking people into the pit of death, really! In modern times, however, Greece hasn't been as reputable. Their most notable athletic achievements of the modern day include their above-average water polo teams, a rising young tennis star, and four brothers who happen to be quite good at basketball. Well, at least one of them, that is. <laughs> He ain't number one, though. No. We know who the hell that is. Give it here. Give it here right now. It comes as no surprise, then, that Greece as a footballing nation has never been much of an international force. Prior to the turn of the century, Greece had only made two total appearances in international tournaments, once at Euro 1980, where they finished last, and once at the 1994 World Cup, where they again finished last, this time with no goals scored or points collected. It wasn't that Greece lacked any talent. In fact, some of their greatest ever players, such as forward Mimis Papawanu and midfielder Mimis Damazos, came together throughout the 70s on some notable Greek national teams. Despite the high level of technical ability and cohesion these teams showed, they were still unable to find any sort of international success. Following their failure to qualify for the 2002 World Cup in South Korea and Japan, Greece would fire their manager Vasilis Daniel and replace him with an outsider, German coach Otto Ray Hagel. I am the king of your Otto was a former defender throughout the German Bundesliga, most notably playing for teams such as Hertha Berlin and FC Kaiserslautern. 
Following his career, he began coaching throughout the German leagues. In the 80s and early 90s, he helped reform a modest Werder Bremen team into a German powerhouse, winning the German league and the DFB Pokal multiple times off the back of strong defensive play and midfield engines who would continuously cause disruption in opponents. Otto fit the mold of a stereotypical Greek coach. He wanted his team to be resolute on defense and constantly pressure the opponent to wear them out. For their final two World Cup qualifying games against Finland and England, Otto would evaluate the Greek national team from the sidelines, looking for the right group of players to emulate his tactics on the field. Greece's 2-2 draw with England in that last qualifying game proved to Otto that his team could handle the tactics and believe in his vision. Now, the only obstacle he had to deal with for the upcoming European Championship qualifiers was getting the team to believe in each other. Loyalty to the club is one of the founding pillars of soccer. Supporters of a club feel that players should harbor loyalty to the club they've either grown up with or had strong years with, and as such, fight the hardest against their most bitter rivals. Greek clubs are no different from this rule. The three biggest clubs at the time in Greece were Olympiakos, Panathinaikos, and AEK Athens, and all happened to be rivals throughout the time period leading up to Euro 2004. Located just 20 minutes apart from each other across Athens, all three clubs are staples of the Alpha Ethniki Greek League. From the 1997-1998 season up until the 2003-2004 season, Olympiakos, Panathinaikos, and AEK all finished in the top three of the Greek League. Their matches have long been bloodbaths, with multiple instances of violent outbursts and suspensions in official matches. The matches between Olympiakos and Panathinaikos, the two most successful Greek clubs, is even known as the Derby of the Eternal Enemies, and featured a total of 10 red cards given to Panathinaikos across a total of four games throughout the 1996-97 season through the 1998-99 season. All three clubs also suffered from societal class differences. Olympiakos historically represented the working class people of the port city Piraeus outside of Athens. Panathinaikos represented the wealthy suburbs of Athens, and AEK was built from the ground up by refugees and immigrants after the First World War. While the players didn't necessarily deal with these class differences, they certainly understood the importance of the badge they wore and the fans they represented. Coach Otto's first task was attempting to break these strong bonds of loyalty to the club and bring the native players together over one shared ideology in the national team. Things didn't work out so well at first, especially given the fact that around two-thirds of the squad at the time came from one of the big three clubs, and players put their priority in their club over the national team. Otto attempted to change that, insisting at every chance he got that the national team had to come first. Country needed to come before club. Slowly but surely, the team began to grow and understand one another, put club differences aside, and formed a core group of national team regulars who would sacrifice their lives for one another. With the players finally united in training with one goal in mind, the Greek team looked towards their next task, qualifying for Euro 2004. As with most international tournaments, Greece had to go through preliminary qualifying groups in order to qualify for Euro 2004. The qualifying stage consisted of 50 nations divided into five different seeding pots based on a coefficient metric of the average points per game a nation obtained during qualifying for Euro 2000 and the 2002 World Cup. Hosts Portugal were the only nation that were automatically qualified for the final for hosting the tournament, and France were given the top seed regardless of their coefficient based on winning Euro 2000. Ten groups would be made from the five pots, with one team per pot being placed in each group. The top team per group after the qualifying stage would automatically qualify for the final stage, while the second place team from each group would go on to a two-legged playoff against another second place team where the winner would also qualify. After calculation, Greece was placed in pot 3 as the 29th highest coefficient, and they would later go on to be drawn into group 6 alongside Spain, Ukraine, Northern Ireland, and Armenia. On paper, this draw was favorable towards Greece. Sure, they did end up with second-ranked Spain, who was widely projected to top the group, but they also ended up with a formidable yet vulnerable 18th-ranked Ukraine, who they could overtake to sneak into that second-place playoff. Match weeks 1 and 2 would give them the opportunity to get out on the right foot as well, playing Spain at home before traveling to Kiev to play Ukraine. Any points picked up here would be huge to ensure their qualification for Euro 2004. Ο Ραούλ εδώ τον βλέπετε παρά λίγο να προλάβει και να έχουμε δύσκολες καταστάσεις. Εδώ λάθος, η μπαλαγιά του Ραούλ και πάλι έχει ευκαιρία να σουτάρει, πλασάρει 
Τραγικό λάθο τη ελληνική άμυνα το οποίο δεν χαρίζει γρήγορη αντεπίδευση των Ισπανών. Βυθέντε με τον Πατσατζόγλου που τον έχει ταλαιπωρήσει αρκετά. Πάει και ο Καραγκούνη, κάνει το γύρισμα για να δούμε επικίνδυνα τα πράγματα. Στρώνεται στο Βαλερόν 2-0. 2-0 από το Βαλερόν σε μια φάση που και πάλι κοιμήθηκε η άμυνα τη Ελλάδα. Βορομπέι. Στα βγάλει απέναντι για τον Ζουμπόφ. Η παλιά του Ζουμπόφ για τον Βορομπέι. Πάει να κάνει το κοντρόλ, μη γυρίσει. Κάνει το σουτ 1-0. 1-0 για του Ουκρανού. Η μπάλα τιμωρεί. Και εδώ ο Βορομπέι, είπαμε να μην γυρίσει, πρόλαβε, γύρισε. Και... Επικίνδυνα ο Βορονίνης στο τέτα τέτ, απέναντι από τον Νικοπολίδη, πάει να πλασάρει με δύναμη. Είναι το δεύτερο γκολ για τους Ουκρανούς με εντελώς ανοιγμένη την ελληνική άμυνα. To nobody's surprise, Greece were thoroughly contained by both Spain and Ukraine during their opening matches. Greece failed to score in both games and looked like a team that wasn't defensively sound enough to match up well against the top teams in the group. Greece was able to secure a 2-0 win on the final match day of the international break against lowly Armenia, but this result was expected for a side who wanted to contend for progression out of their group. Both players and manager alike had much to think about after that first break. Otto ran a supposedly structured defensive system, and yet both Spain and Ukraine were able to break it down effectively. Likewise, only Dimis Nikolaidis was able to put his name on the score sheet. Which players would step up the scoring? And could the defense find a way to be resolute against the top squads? Sometimes, all you really need is a mental reset, and the rest will all fall into place. Κάνει και μια τρίπλα ο Βενετίδης για να τα αποδώσει αυτή τη σκοτάκη νωρίτερα. Για να δούμε τον Σούτα που έκανε ακόπουλο. Κόλ! Κόλ! Εκπληκτικό πάλι για τον Στέλλη Ακόπουλο. Αυτή είναι από το λάθος του Γκρίσσα. Κέρι Στέας με το Ρίζο Ρακ. 1-0 Γκρίσσα. Ένα γκολ με τον Σούτα που έκανε ακόπουλο. Αυτή είναι η ωραία να περάσει πάλι ο Βρίζας. Ο Άντας Μάλλον η σέντρα που γίνεται τώρα και παλιά του Βρίζα. Κόλ! Η εθνική μας ομάδα ανοίγει το σκορ σε μια Χωρίς να πιέζει ως τώρα, αυτό δεν έχει καμιά σημασία. σημασία. Για τον Γιανακόπουλο που τη βρίσκει για τον Βρίζα. Για να δούμε, τέτα τέτα, ο Βρίζας κοντά στον κόλ, πέναλτι. Πέναλτι πρέπει να είναι πέναλτι, σε είδε. Το 68ο λεπτό του αγώνα. Ο Τσάρτα στο τέλος, γκολ, 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 γκολ. Ένα μηδέν από τον Βασίλη Τσάρτα. Η πρώτη σφραγίδα μπαίνει για το διαβατήριο. Στο 68, δεν χάνεται πια από το παιχνίδι. Με 10 παίκτες έμεινα δηλαδή, άψογο το πέναλτι του Τσάρτα με το αριστερό. In stories like this, I always like to look at the little things that paint the whole picture. Yes, Greece were tremendously strong in defense, and just good enough to squeak out a goal or two in each of their remaining games. But they also needed Spain to falter to go on this miraculous run. And I think I found the turning point. Spain vs Ukraine, March 29th, 2003. The first game back in the international break. Ukraine takes an early lead, but Spain pulled two goals back in the 83rd and 87th minute to take the lead. Normally, a goal this late in the game would be a decider, especially for a team of Spain's quality. But Ukraine kept pushing. In the last minute of extra time, with one of the last kicks of the game, Alexander Gorshkov did this. At the time, this last minute goal wasn't seen as a detriment to Spain's qualifying campaign. They were still leading the group and had a game in hand over second place Ukraine. Greece wasn't even a threat at this stage. But this game showed that Spain wasn't this unbeatable giant that the media made them out to be. Later that summer, both Greece and Northern Ireland would put up amazingly strong defensive performances against Spain. Spain would end up dropping points in both of these matches, and Greece was able to slip into the top spot in the group. What's even more interesting about how this group played out is that you could argue Greece wasn't the most dominant team. Greece finished qualifying tied for the lowest goal differential among qualified teams, and they also scored the fewest goals among qualified teams. What set Greece apart from the rest of the teams, however, was just how impressive they were on defense after that first match week of games. After conceding four goals on their opening two matches, Greece registered clean sheets in all six of their remaining matches, tied for the most out of any of the qualified teams. Otto's men worked tirelessly in the midfield to slow attacks down, and were rigidly structured at the back and in net to neutralize a goal threat. The goals also came from an unlikely source. Youngster Angelos Heristeas was only 23 during the qualifying stage, but left his mark as the top goal scorer of the team. 
netting two goals against Northern Ireland and one goal against Ukraine to pick up six crucial points for the Greeks. With the qualifying stage now complete, the 15 qualified teams and host Portugal were placed into four pots of four teams based on their updated European coefficient metric. Despite being the winners of their qualifying group, Greece was the second lowest seeded team of the entire tournament, only ranked higher than Latvia, a country with a population of only 2.2 million people in 2004, and who were only able to barely make it in the tournament thanks to two second half goals in their playoff against Turkey. Greece was therefore placed in the lowest seeded drawing pot, pot 4. Teams in pot 4 are not always expected to make it out of the group stage in the European Championship. For comparison, in this year's Euro 2020 tournament, the five lowest seeded teams in pot 4 all failed to make it out of the group stage, with Wales being the only pot 4 team to qualify before being swiftly eliminated in the round of 16. As the draw for Euro 2004 began, Greece watched on as they learned of their opponents in this group stage. Host nation Portugal, playoff winners Russia, and Spain? Yes, Spain, the team Greece narrowly beat out in points for the qualifying stage. They glided through their playoff against Norway with a 5-1 aggregate scoreline to qualify for the group stage. As with their qualifying group, Greece were not seen as favorites to progress out of the group stage. The majority of pundits predicted Spain and Portugal to easily progress to the knockouts, with only some giving any sort of praise to Greece in the form of a potential spoiler, despite their 150 to 1 odds of winning the tournament. In fact, Greece as a squad weren't even too keen on their chances to make it out of the group stage. Midfielder Ciartas stated, quote, The target at the start was to win a game, just one game. It was something none of the national teams had been able to do at a major finals. That would have counted as a success, winning just once. Defender Nikos Dabizas was more blunt. The only target we had at Euro 2004 was to be competitive represent the country with pride, and improve on that dreadful record in America. We didn't really have the goal of qualifying from our group, it didn't seem a realistic approach. As the week before the tournament began, Greece was spared no extra time to prepare for their Group A opening match, as they were to play the first match of the entire tournament against host nation Portugal. Portugal had a squad filled with household iconic names, Luis Figo, Pauleta, Deco, Rui Costa, and even a young Manchester United starlet named Cristiano Ronaldo. Greece, on the other hand, still had a majority of homegrown Greek league players, not these big name stars that the Portuguese had. Not only was there immense pressure on this Greece squad due to them playing against the home team and their respective crowd, but most of these players hadn't played in such a big atmosphere in their careers. Questions were raised whether this Greece team would be able to handle the pressure and continue their run of good form from the qualifying stage into this opening match. Greece would need to come out swinging to show the rest of Europe that they meant business. A last minute goal by Ronaldo couldn't help the Portuguese in this one. An early defensive slip up and a second half penalty gave Greece all the confidence in the world to set up shop and secure their first ever victory at an international tournament. In what was arguably their hardest match of the group stage, Greece executed their tactics perfectly, capitalizing on Portugal's mistakes and frustrating their attacks throughout the midfield and defense. Coach Otto called the victory, quote, the biggest win of any Greek team ever. The Greek players now had a bit of confidence moving forward. They had done their country proud, and Greece as a nation was beginning to notice their little squad making noise on the international stage. Greece's next opponent four days later was Spain, a team that Greece had much experience against and had beaten them most recently. Spain, however, wanted revenge and opened the scoring in the 28th minute with a close range strike. Then, in the second half, Greece came out swinging. In the qualifying stage, goal scorer Heristeus tied it up with a deflected goal to share the points after match two. At this point, Greece's prospects of moving on to the next stage looked great. They were leading the table, albeit only by goals scored, and played the worst team in the group in Russia, while Portugal played Spain. Any points picked up here would guarantee Greece in the playoffs, a feat not thought possible at the start of the tournament. All Greece needed to do against Russia was continue their defensive strength and find a way to- Oh. That was quick. Well, that's okay. Greece just needs to pull one. Well. 
That didn't go to plan. Even though Greece pulled one back, Russia would go on to see the game out. The worst case scenario just happened for Greece, and now their fate wasn't necessarily in their hands. A 3-2 win for Portugal would make Greece and Spain tied in all categories for second place, and any higher scoreline could result in Spain making it through on goals scored. With that known, Greece anxiously waited for the other match's result, needing just one team to slip up. What's that old saying again? History tends to repeat itself. Just like the group stage, Spain faltered at the end, conceding in the 57th minute and being unable to pull any goals back. Just like the group stage, Greece finished above Spain by the skin of their teeth. But unlike the group stage, Spain would not have the opportunity to progress, as Greece would take second place in Group A. It was a range of emotions for the Greeks, excitement at progressing and making their country proud, seriousness in preparation for whoever their next opponent would be, and a bit of panic because plans had to be cancelled. Yeah, some of the Greek players had planned vacations and weddings as they hadn't expected to stay in the tournament for long and needed to reschedule them for the knockout stage. All that was left was for them to wait for the results of the matches of Group B the next day to find out their opponent. France. Greece had to play... France. Uh. France was arguably the strongest side at Euro 2004. They were the winners of the previous Euros in 2000 and had cruised through both the qualifying and group stage, having won 10 out of 11 throughout the stages and only drawing once. France also boasted one of the most talented squads of their generation, including the likes of Zinedine Zidane, Thierry Henry, Vigente Lizarazu, and Patrick Vieira. Attempting to beat this French team was like attempting to stop a charging bull. You could get close, but in the end, the bull always wins. Coach Otto had his hands full trying to figure out a way to break down France's prolific attack in midfield. He knew he didn't have the quality of players that France had at their disposal, but he also noticed that France struggled in games against structured defenses where their stars were unable to break down the opponent's shape. Otto changed his strategy to best utilize this concept, instructing his right back, Yorkas Setaridis, to man mark Henri while the rest of the defense in midfield used his own structure. To the world's surprise, his plan ended up working out perfectly. The 65th minute header by Harris Deus ended up being the difference in a dominant defensive performance by the Greeks. Henri's goal threat was effectively shut down, and the French midfield struggled to break down the Greeks' commanding back line. With this win against the favorite of the tournament, Greece started to believe that they could do something special. One more win against the Czech Republic, and Greece could see themselves in the final. That once unheard of dream was starting to find some footing in reality. By this point, Greece as a nation had fully backed their national team, but the rest of the world was almost eager to see them exit the tournament. Whereas teams like the Czech Republic and Portugal played dazzling, exciting football, Greece were more than willing to set up a long defensive slugfest and run the game out. The media had already dubbed them as boring, with one writer from The Guardian calling them, quote, the only underdogs in history everyone wants to see get beaten. Even UEFA execs were worried their slow play would affect viewership or how other teams would play. Greece knew that everyone was against their style, but they also understood it was the only way they stood a chance against any of the other teams. De Bezos would go on to reflect after the tournament, stating, quote, We weren't Brazilians, Spaniards, or Germans. We had to be realistic, relying on defense, taking advantage of set pieces, and being very effective on the counter. And in their semi-final against the Czech Republic, they did just that. The Greeks relied heavily on defense, nullifying each and every attempt the Czechs made on goal. As the full-time whistle blew, both sides were deadlocked at nil-nil, meaning extra time was in store. Now, most tournament matches that go into extra time use a two 15-minute half extra time system, where either the winner is determined at the end of the second half, or the match moves into penalties. This tournament was different. You see, back at the start of the 2002-2003 season, UEFA had decided to experiment using the silver goal system in UEFA events such as Euro 2004. In the silver goal system, if a team is winning after the first half of extra time has been played, that team is determined to be the winner. This system intended to build off the feedback the golden goal system had 
when it was implemented near the turn of the century by giving the team who conceded an opportunity to potentially pull a goal back before the half ended. However, back in February 2004, the International Footballing Association Board ruled that the silver goal system would be abolished after Euro 2004. At the time, it had only come into play in the 2003 UEFA Champions League match between Ajax and Grazer AK as Ajax scored a penalty in the 103rd minute to win the game at the half. But other than that, no game had ended early thanks to a silver goal. No game, that is, except for this one. In what was one of the last kicks of the half, Greek defender Trianos Delas headed home a corner at the near post. The Czechs simply had no time to respond. Greece had made it to the finals. With the finals now two days away, Greece and coach Otto had to balance preparing for a rematch with host nation Portugal and juggling the squad's personalities. Beating the host nation, who had already overcome difficult matches against England and the Netherlands, would be no easy task, especially given the fact that key attacker Georgos Karagounis had picked up a yellow card against the Czech Republic and would be unable to play in the final due to accumulating too many bookings. The squad itself was facing tension as well. Multiple players had been caught in disputes with each other and the Greek FA, including complaints of lost salaries and lost playing time. A squad that had done so much off the back of teamwork and unity seemed to be at its breaking point with its most important match coming up. Both Otto and the players recognized they needed to resolve these conflicts quickly. A private team meeting was held that afternoon, where players and coaches alike expressed their frustrations and found ways to compromise and listen to each other. They all agreed that, prior to this tournament, nobody would have predicted the run they were on. We told each other that this was the only opportunity that we would get to write history, said midfielder Ciartes. We knew we would never be able to recreate what had happened. We vowed then to give everything to make sure we did not need to. As the players left that meeting and began training for the final, everyone had the same goal in mind. Greece was going to walk away with that trophy, no matter what. This is what they're playing for. The Ore de Lornay Trophy. The cup that signifies the champion nation of Europe. Eight previous winners. There will be a new name on Europe's Roll of Honor in a couple of hours time. At long last, the day arrived. Greece, Portugal, almost 63,000 fans packed the Estadio de Luz in Lisbon to watch the rematch between a true David in Greece and a Goliath in Portugal. As the lineups were set and the teams began their walk onto the pitch, the media began to reflect on how both teams made it to the finals, and they made an interesting discovery in Greece's run. Both the quarterfinals against France and semifinals against the Czech Republic played out in the exact same fashion. The Greeks played stellar defense, scored a headed goal to go up one, and would defend some more to see out the 1-0 victory. Even the crosses for those headers came from the same right side of the pitch. It was almost as if all Portugal really needed to do was prevent any crosses from that right side, and they didn't have to worry about being scored on. Portugal did just that. Throughout the first half, Portugal limited the opportunities Greece had on net and continuously fired on the Greek goal, forcing goalkeeper Antonios Nikopolaitis into action multiple times. Going into halftime, it seemed that Portugal were the better side, even though Greece had absorbed the pressure very well. A second half goal might be inevitable for the Portuguese given the number of attempts they had. Greece needed a hero who could get a goal so that the team could focus on defending that slim lead. Maybe it would be Stelios, the only goal scorer away against Spain during the qualifier stage, who helped realize the Euro 2004 dream for the Greeks. Maybe it would be Theodoros Zagarakis, the captain and presumed player of the tournament should Greece find a win here. Or maybe, just maybe. It would be Angelos Heristeas, the still young 24-year-old forward who just so happened to play for Werder Bremen, coach Otto's former club who he brought success to in the 80s and 90s. Heristeas, the top goal scorer for Greece in the qualifying stage and who helped secure two massive wins in the process. Heristeas, the lone goal scorer against favorites France from a header off a cross from the right side of the pitch. Where is Heristeus at now, by the way? Oh, there he is.
the entirety of a nation waits in silence, ready to explode at any moment. No pressure, kid. Semi-final, they've got a goal here. The heading power of Harris Dias. They've scored from the corner again. He lifted his head and Portugal hang theirs. It's over, it is over. Greece are the champions of Europe. The ultimate outsiders at the start of the tournament. If you enjoyed this video, it would mean a lot if you subscribed, left a like, and shared this video with a friend or two. If you have any ideas for an upcoming highly unlikely video, make sure to leave it in the comments down below. You can also follow me on Twitter and Twitch at Cobra Live. Other than that, it's been Cobra. Peace out. There's nothing to say about you, you're just so happy, you know? But there's, there's no words, there's no explanation. There's no explanation. Uh, what happened today was very nice. We won Portugal, one of the best teams in Europe. We won fairly, I suppose. And it can't be luck.